Good morning, everyone, and a warm welcome to uh, our annual employment seminar at Stevenson Harwood. For those of you that don't know me, um, my name's Paul Reeves. I'm a partner here at the employment team and head of the employment practice. We've got a great lineup for you this morning with a variety of topics that we're going to cover. Um, but before we do get into um, each of the presentations, which will roughly last about 10, 10 minutes or so, um, there's a few housekeeping points. Um, the first point I should mention, um, particularly because we've got Katie with us from our data protection team, um, the session is being recorded. Um, I think if I didn't mention that, um, Katie would take me to task on that. Um, we will, after the event, be distributing a recording of each of the sessions. So if you do need to duck out and come back in, it's entirely up to you. You can kind of pick and choose. Um, but we will be circulating videos of, of all the sessions um, afterwards. There'll be a Q&A session at the end. Um, we are scheduled to run till about 10.45ish, but uh, we can stay online until 11, if depending on the, the number of um, questions we get. If we don't get through all the questions, we will follow up with you individually. So if you could use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to um, insert your question and, and if you can um, make sure your name's included, we can, we can then follow up with you if we, we do run out of time. So in the interest of time, um, I'll now hand over to Richard that's going to talk to us about IR35 um, with the impending deadline that's coming up shortly. Richard, over to you. Thanks, Paul. So, as I'm sure uh, many of you already know, um, a change to the IR35 rules is coming into force on the 6th of April this year. Um, IR35 applies where an individual provides services um, via an intermediary service company, where if they'd been engaged directly, they would have been an employee for uh, tax and national insurance purposes. Uh, an intermediary is usually a personal, personal services company, but it can take other forms. Um, currently, in the private sector, uh, the intermediary is liable to self-assess whether or not the payments received for the individual services are caught by the IR35 rules, and the risk of getting that assessment wrong rests with the intermediary. But from the 6th of April this year, the private sector will largely be brought into line with the public sector, where the end user will be responsible for deciding whether or not an engagement comes within IR35, and the business that contracts with the intermediary pay the fee pair will be responsible for operating PAYE. Effectively, the risk of getting that assessment wrong would then also rest with the end user. And shifting the R35 exposure so that it falls on the end user of the individual ser individual's services really is going to create an extra compliance burden and a significant extra compliance burden for those who are using the services provided or services provided by individuals who act via intermediaries. Now, moving on to the next slide, there is one, one exemption um, to this. Um, the new rules in the, in the private sector will apply to medium and large companies, but not to small companies. Um, the definition of small companies is going to follow the form that's currently contained in the, the Companies Act definition, and, and that's summarized in, on this slide. So effectively, if an organization falls within the small companies exclusion, then these new rules will not apply to it. So moving on to the, to the next slide, one of the key parts, one of the key um, elements of this change is the employment status determination. And that requires the end client, uh, or, or that, that requires the end client to be responsible for making a status determination in respect of whether the individual is an employee for tax purposes. Uh, they must do so with reasonable care, and the status determination and the reasons for it must be passed directly to the individual and the status determination and those reasons must also be passed down the labour supply chain. So whether that's to an employment agency or, or the intermediary, whichever is next in line. The individual or the entity in the, in the labour supply chain, which is uh, dealing directly with the individual other than the intermediary, uh, can challenge that status determination. Um, and within 45 days of receiving such a challenge, uh, the end client must respond to it. It can either affirm uh, with reasons its original decision, or it can provide a different status determination which would supersede the earlier one. Um, 
And again, a failure by the end client to take those steps using reasonable care could make it liable for employee income tax and NICS. Now, importantly, there is no further appeal process. So there is no higher body uh, which the individual or anyone in the labour supply chain can take this to uh, in this state of determination process. So ultimately, it is the, it is the end user's decision. Um, moving on to the, to the next slide, here are a couple of, of worked examples of how this will, will operate in practice. Um, so in the first example, uh, the client is dealing directly with the, the individual's personal services company. And in that situation, the client is both responsible for making the status determination and if it's determined that the individual is an employee for tax and NI purposes, uh, it has the, the obligation to operate uh, the payroll, the POE obligation. In the second example, just beneath that, uh, there's a supply chain where there is also an employment agency in place. So in this situation, the end client will still be responsible for making the status determination and passing it to the individual and also the next party in the supply chain by the employment agency. But in this case, it will be the employment agency as the fee payer, which is responsible for operating PAYE. Um, so on the next slide, there are a few, a few points to, to note in respect to the status determination. Um, you need to be doing this as, as soon as possible. Uh, a couple of reasons for this. Um, firstly, um, obviously this is coming into force very soon. So any consultants that are currently uh, engaged, you need to be addressing that uh, in any status determination in respect of those consultants. Um, but secondly, both with regards to current uh, consultants and also people you're bringing, bringing on board, there's going to like, or there will likely be a need to consult with the individual. Um, there could, and I'll come on to this in a, in a minute, there's, there may well be a need to renegotiate terms, but with, with new consultants and contractors, there will likely be, or may well be, uh, additional steps in respect of onboarding the client. So, if the end user, for example, doesn't have a payroll function already, but is going to have to operate a payroll function, then obviously steps will need to be taken to put that in place. Um, as I've touched on already, um, the end client needs to make the status determination with, with reasonable care. So this is not something you want to be doing at, at the last minute uh, on a whim. Um, and failure to, to make the status determination with reasonable care or do it at all may well expose the client uh, itself to tax and NI liability. And similarly, if you fail to pass on the status determination, uh, that can also make you liable for tax and NI um, until you pass it on. Um, there's also a risk uh, in these new rules of an end, end client actually having a secondary liability um, as a result of any any entity in the supply chain failing to comply with their obligations. So if there is a status determination made, they pass it down the line and let's say an employment agency does not operate PAYE as it should do, then there is the possibility of the end client actually being liable to HMRC for that failure. So it's important that your contractual, uh, or you have appropriate protection in your contractual documents with each member of the supply chain. Um, so what about the impact of, of these changes on the next slide? Clearly, these are going to have, or well, there is the potential for these changes to have, have very significant impacts for end users um, who use a number of, of uh, consultants. There's clearly going to be an increase in administrative costs. You're going to have to take the time and expense to, to actually carry out these status determinations. Um, I think the big one is the, the potential introduction of the cost of employers' national insurance contributions. Um, they will rest with the fee payer, um, which could possibly be the end user if there's a direct relationship between the end user and the intermediary. Um, now, the legislation, current legislation, is, is very clear that actually um, those employer, the cost of the employer NICS cannot be passed on, whether directly or indirectly, to uh, an individual. So those employer NICS are going to have to be borne by the fee pair. And obviously that is going to have an impact or potentially have an impact on the pricing of services um, with, a, with a fee pair looking to increase uh, their, or, or sorry, 
decrease the potential cost as a result of that. But as I say, you've got to be careful not to actually be passing on the cost of uh, the employer's next directly or indirectly. And on the flip side, the consultants may be looking to drive up their prices, uh, their daily rates or hourly rates, because they could well be faced with a higher uh, tax liability if their fees are going to be taxed via uh, PAYE. Um, the, the added complexity, or well not complexity, but the added burden, of course, is that the position in respect of VAT is not affected by these by the expansion of, of the R35 rules. So it could well be the, the position that VAT is due on the fees, but also uh, the fee payer is having to deduct employees, NICs, and uh, income tax from the fees being paid. I think, I think it's fair to say that this has the potential to impact the, the contractor workforce significantly. Um, as, we, as we've said, uh, or as I've, I've intimated, I think there's a, there's a good chance that some contractors will look at this and think, well, if I'm being taxed anyway as an employee, uh, where, is the, where is the benefit for me to continue to be a contractor? So people may move away from, from looking to be engaged by, as, as a contractor, which could lead to uh, skills short or, or, or a gap, which could previously be, be uh, filled by contractors. Um, and on the flip side, um, these individuals may well also start asking the question, well, if you're taxing me as an employee, uh, why aren't I getting the other benefits that employees and workers have, uh, such as holiday pay, um, pension contributions, and, and similar. And I think that's one of the big, big potential issues that uh, you need to be aware of if you are using consultants. If there is a positive status determination made, then the follow-up is you need to be assessing the risk of, well, Hang on, where does that leave us in respect of potential liability of employment and worker status claims? Because whilst they're not adjudicated by the same um, body, uh, the tests are, are very similar. So moving on to the next slide, what should you be doing now if you haven't already? Well, you want to be auditing existing arrangements, conducting a careful analysis of current working practices, um, and looking to identify looking to identify who in your workforce you will need to be making a status determination in respect of uh, and plan how you're going to assess employment status put a process in place and because of, of of the impending introduction of these of this legislation you need to be looking to carry out status determinations uh, very soon you can use the cess tool uh, which which hmrc have online uh, as a helpful guidance but don't rely 100% on that. Uh, it should be approached with, with caution. It's only as good as the information you put in, and HMRC will not definitively be, be bound by it. Um, you also want to put in place a process to deal with appeals, reviewing your payroll systems, onboarding policies, uh, and other processes to ensure the business can, uh, can apply. If, if you are the, the, uh, the fee pay, you can comply with your POA obligations if you need to. Uh, and as I've touched on, carry out and pass on these status determinations ahead of 6th of April 2021. Um, and also uh, look, look to whether your, your current commercial arrangements are actually going to work um, if you are going to have to apply PAYE or, or operate PAYE in respect of fees being paid to consultants. It, it may well be the case that you're going to have to renegotiate terms, both commercial uh, and uh, contractual terms, so that you get the necessary information from contractors to carry out these status determinations and can deduct or can operate PAYE if you need to do so. So plenty to think about um, ahead of the 6th of April. Um, obviously here to help you uh, if you if you require it. Um, I mean, it's fair to say that HMRC expects to raise significant additional tax revenue as a result of these changes. Um, and I think, there is a, a significant greater risk on end users using consultants as a result of the introduction of this uh, off payroll working regime from the 6th of April. Um, I'll now hand you back to, to Paul, who I think is going to introduce uh, Katie to talk about uh, the subject access requests. Thanks, Richard. For the uh, next session, we're going to cover data subject access requests. I think just one point on what you've just said there, Richard. Um, we are seeing a number of clients at the moment now taking the approach of cancelling those um, contractor status uh, arrangements they have and moving the individuals onto um, permanent terms and conditions of employment. So it seems as though the government's plan is, is being um, achieved. 
Um, so on to the next topic. Those of you that know me well will, will know that this is a topic particularly close to my heart, data subject access requests, and how happy it makes me to receive one from the claimant solicitors. So Katie is going to take us through some practical guidance on the data subject access requests. Over to you, Katie. Hello, I love your t-shirt. I'm so jealous I want one, Paul. Um, as you say, um, I, it, you know, data subject access requests are something that cause an absolute pain um, to a lot of employers. Uh, and I think if there's any key message I want you to take away from today is that they don't have to be a complete nightmare. There have been various developments recently that mean you maybe you can start to say to yourself, I do really love DSARS. Um, so I think one of the key factors that causes many employers concern with their subject access requests is timing. Um, and because you're seeing more and more of them, as I know from experience with my clients, it's, it's, a, it's an incredible burden, particularly when the clock is ticking. Um, I think just sort of anecdotally, I'm seeing a lot more subject access requests in the past year or so with all the economic disruption of COVID-19. Um, so it, yeah, it's, it's certainly the timing makes it a particular issue for many employers. Just in passing, um, the rule um, that on timing previously used to be that you could start the clock from uh, the day after you received the request. It's now the day that, that you received the request. The ICO has changed the guidance on that. Um, and it's the corresponding date rule. So you're looking at the same day in the next month. You can have two more months um, if the request is complex. And that's something you should consider when you do receive a DSAR. Uh, because the ICO has, has helpfully put out some guidance um, on the factors that you can consider as to complexity. And, you know, it is something worth bearing in mind. If you're having technical difficulties retrieving personal data, for example, if it's archived, um, if you need specialist legal advice where you normally wouldn't get it routinely on DSARS. So if you're coming to us, that is in itself a factor. If you're not, if you're not routinely coming to us for DSARS, that the request may be complex. Um, so that's also worth bearing in mind. Um, if there are special legal issues that you have to consider around children's data or medical data, um, that they're also a factor in complexity. And volume, while in itself, a, a large volume of data doesn't inherently make a request complex, it can add to complexity. So if there are other complex factors there, plus there's a huge um, amount of data being requested, it's definitely something worth considering whether you can justify a complex um, determination because that will give you that extra two months. The other um, recent factor that's been helpful on timing is the ICO guidance again from uh, the end of last year. Previous, previously on the stopping the clock um, uh, uh, issue around if you're clarifying a subject access request. Uh, so previously the ICO said if you needed to clarify a request, if it's not clear what someone's asking for, then the clock um, would carry on running. So you wouldn't get gain any time from doing that. You, you would just have to sort of wait to hear back, possibly very near the deadline and have to scramble to produce what the requester wanted, which wasn't very workable in practice. Um, so now the ICO has changed the guidance to say that the clock will be stopped if you are clarifying a request. So the amount of days that the requester takes to clarify, um, you, you add that on to the end of the ultimate deadline. That is helpful. It doesn't mean you can uh, clarify purely to obstruct or delay. That's definitely, that's definitely not the intention. But if there is a lack of clarity about what's needed, you, you know, you are perfectly entitled as an employer to say to the um, individual, is there actually something you're particularly after here? Um, you can only do so if you have a, a large amount of data about the person. But as most employee DSARs, you know, are about people who've, who've worked for some time, it's fairly, it's fairly kind of justifiable to, to clarify a request if there's any kind of lack of certainty about what the person wants. 
Um, so it can be helpful um, in not just in that it stops the clock, but in that the person might come back and say, well, actually, I only want data from this particular period or relating to this particular issue. And you can actually, in some cases, get involved in a kind of constructive dialogue around search terms and, and what they're actually looking for. In other cases, as I'm sure many of you know, the requester uh, won't play ball and it might just say, no, I want all of my data for the last 10 years. And whilst technically they are entitled to do, to do that, um, there is also the fact, and this almost brings us onto the next topic, that you're only entitled, uh, you're only required, sorry, to carry out a reasonable search, a reasonable proportionate search. So if someone comes back after a clarification and asks for an unreasonable amount of data, you would then have to take a view on what you need to do that's reasonable in order to comply with your obligations. If we go onto the slide, I think we've kind of started on the next topic, which is basically the, the second issue that employers find with DSARS is that it's, it's a huge, the searching itself is a huge burden. I've put the, the current test from the ICO guidance on the slide is that you have to make reasonable efforts to find and retrieve personal data. And in particular, the ICO has acknowledged usefully that you can take into account the context of the circumstances of the request, the difficulties involved in finding the data and the fundamental nature of the right of access. Because obviously, you know, this is a fundamental right. But if someone is asking apparently just to just be a nuisance or if they're asking for, um, you know, for a disproportionate amount of information, that's definitely something to take into account. And I would also say, whilst the ICO doesn't um, mention it specifically in the guidance, the context of the circumstances, um, the fact that that's relevant could mean that an employment you know, dispute, um, you'd be entitled to take into account the fact that someone is uh, you know, potentially just looking to cause trouble. So you can take all that into account in what you think a reasonable search is if someone isn't playing ball and, and, and clarifying things for you appropriately. Um, but in particular, I mean, if there's, it's, it's important to bear in mind what detriment could be caused to the individual by, um, by not having access to their information. So that's really important. The more significant uh, the impact on the individual, the more important it is to, to search for that information. Um, the other thing that eases the search burden on employers is the exemptions, as I'm sure you'll all be aware. Um, in particular, the recent ICO guidance was particularly helpful on manifestly unfounded or manifestly excessive. And that is a, an exemption in which you are not required to reply to a DSAR that is manifestly unfounded or manifestly excessive. And the ICO goes through several factors as to what that means. If, um, and we often see these in, in employment cases, so it's particularly important to bear these in mind. If um, an, a subject, um, a data subject is trying to be malicious or harass you, uh, or they, it, there's something obvious from the correspondence that shows that there is no intention to exercise uh, their rights, there's no real uh, desire to actually obtain their data, they're doing it to put pressure on you to settle. Um, if there's an obvious indication of that, you could find the subject access request manifestly unfounded and refuse to um, comply with it, or alternatively, uh, charge them a fee if, they, if, they, if you decide that you really want to comply with it, but you can charge them a fee for your time in, in actually finding all that data. So that's a, a, a useful alternative there. One particular indication we, we see with employment cases is where someone you know, in correspondence will say, I will withdraw my subject access request if you, um, if you basically settle and give me some money. And it can, sometimes could be as, as blatant as that. And that's a really nice indication, very manifest, I would say, that someone really doesn't want to get hold of their data. They're just doing it as a, as a pressure tactic. And that's something you can push back on. Manifestly excessive is another exemption. And there, in there, it's where a request is clearly or obviously unreasonable. So, take into account all of the circumstances of the request, um, so the nature of the information that's being asked for, 
importantly for employment cases, I think the, the context of the request and the relationship and the resources available to you. So the ICO does expect you to sort of take, in, take into account the fact that whether you're a big or a small organization, what is going on between you and the employee here, that can all be factors that might weigh towards something being manifestly excessive and therefore you not having to reply. So do, do remember that, or if there's repetition or overlap, um, do remember you, do, you have those options available to you. And again, you can either refuse to comply or charge a fee for your time in, and costs in complying. Now this sort of move towards um, the context and the circumstances is it, it, being reflected in some of the case law I've, I've mentioned there. Um, traditionally and technically still, DSARs are purpose blind, so you're not supposed to take into account the fact there may be a collateral purpose, and that was uh, the, the rule in Dawson Damer and, and previous ICO guidance. But now uh, we've seen this Lease and Lloyds Bank case, um, and, and the recent ICO guidance seems to be reining this in slightly. Um, in the Lloyds Bank case, uh, the courts, the High Court declined to order uh, a further. Um, uh, uh, pr production of information, partly due to the fact that it was a collateral purpose and that there were basically that the requests were abusive um, and repetitious. So it's similar factors that we're seeing in the manifestly unfounded and excessive um, exemptions. While you know requests are still technically purpose blind, we're moving more towards um, the courts and the ICO preventing abuse of the subject assets request system by taking the context into account in some circumstances. So that is an important one to know. I've just run th through a few more of the key exemptions you will often, I'm sure, be considering when you're dealing with subject access requests. The legal professional privilege one has been around for a while, but importantly, in the GDPR, it's sort of been extended, not just to information that's technically privileged, but to information that's held subject to a duty of confidence by a legal advisor. So even if a, a, a solicitor or someone has information that's not technically privileged, there is a, a broader exemption that covers that duty of confidence information as well. Um, the third party personal data exemption is a really important one. Um, you're obviously not supposed to in, uh, disclose anyone else's personal data. Uh, it's only the subject's uh, the data subjects data they're entitled to but where it's mixed you really have to think about um, getting either the third party's consent or considering whether it's reasonable on balance in terms of the harm it would do to the requester to not or to not receive the data versus the harm it would do to the other individual to disclose their data to the requester so I mean that's that's not changed that exemption, but it's it comes up very frequently when trawling through information. There's lots of mixed data in there. Remember briefly that if something is held um, subject to a sort of personal household activity, it's not within the GDPR. It doesn't come within the scope. And therefore, for example, if somebody potentially is holding something in their personal documents or devices and they're processing it for personal household purposes, they won't have to disclose it as part of a subject access request. The, fi the final thing to mention on this slide is that something I often see confusion around is the fact that data subjects are entitled to ask for personal data that they've already seen. So an email that they've sent themselves or that you know, they're entitled to kind of have a copy of that from you, although not many copies, but um, if they've already seen it, it doesn't, there's no exemption for that. Um, but I'm just, I'd just like to throw in the fact that it's important to think about, with partic particularly with emails, whether information actually relates to the data subject. Um, for it, let's take an email as an example. The header, you know, the, the, the email address would obviously be the sender's personal data. But the content of that, bus that business email is often not their personal data, even if they're sending it in the course of their job. If there's nothing that actually relates to them as a person, it doesn't, it's not really about them, it just happens to be an email that they're sending. The content of that email isn't their personal data and therefore doesn't need to be disclosed. So that's, that frequently comes up with data subject as a request and I don't think it's well enough understood. So do bear in mind it's worth uh, reviewing whether um, data is actually 
actually relates to the data subject or is it just something they're doing in their job and it doesn't really concern them as an individual next slide please i just wanted to finish by touching on another issue that i know causes lots of concerns with um and headaches with dsars and that's um sort of the scope of search um where we're getting into personal email accounts personal devices and and sort of unauthorized apps on work devices um the key question for all of these issues is is the employer is the person that has received the dsar it, are they the controller of the data and that's basically what you need to ask yourself for all of these if it's a personal email account um, it, it's not generally um, a requirement to go and ask staff members to surf to search their personal accounts unless there's a good reason to believe that there's something relevant in there um, so we had the ICO guidance on that and that was based on a Hollyoak and Candy decision a few years ago um, so it's not just the general rule is unless that you've got a really good uh, reason to intrude in someone's personal life in that way you don't need to ask them to search personal email accounts personal devices it's a similar rule it may be really difficult to actually sort of enforce uh, in that you can't force someone to give you their personal device um, but they may be in scope depending on when whether the employer is actually sort of authorized personal use of the personal device for work purposes and similarly on work devices again we're sort of if if we're looking at say whatsapp is the classic example if the employer um, has authorized use of whatsapp for for work purposes um, then it could well be that they are the controller of that and you do have to get those accounts or instant messaging accounts or Skype accounts searched um, if uh, if it's unauthorized and people are sort of a few people are doing it but it's not a generally expected app that the employees use as part of their job then it's likely you're not a controller of that data um, and therefore it's not in scope so with that um, I'm going to hand over to my colleague today I wanted to give you an overview of business related travel to the UK post Brexit and also to provide an update in terms of right to work checks. So just to start with, I wanted to give an overview on the business related travel. Uh, can I turn the next slide, please? Thank you. So the UK immigration rules allow individuals to come to the UK as visitors and visitors can undertake business related activities whilst they're here. And depending on the individual's nationality, they'll be considered either visa nationals or non visa nationals. And as the name suggests, visa nationals are required to obtain a visa prior to entering the UK. Non-visa nationals aren't required to obtain a visa and EA nationals are now considered non-visa nationals. So individuals entering the UK, now including EA nationals, um, are limited regarding what activities they are permitted to undertake whilst in the UK for business purposes. So the current slide shows the permitted and prohibited activities visitors can and cannot undertake whilst in the UK. As long as individuals are undertaking the tasks on the left hand side, so for instance, attending meetings, conferences, seminars, coming to the UK to negotiate deals and contracts or to carry out specific site visits, or if they're coming to the UK on behalf of their existing employers to gather information on behalf of the overseas company, these are all considered permitted activities, meaning that the individuals can come to the UK as visitors. There are also additional permitted activities for individuals who are coming to the UK as employees of overseas companies, and they're able to undertake additional tasks such as advising and consulting and providing training. Permitted activities must not amount to visitors undertaking employment or work in the UK, which amounts to them filling a role or providing short term cover for a role whilst in the UK. And under the immigration rules, visitors are able to remain in the UK for up to six months at one time. This could be during one single visit or through multiple visits to the UK. And as you'll note from the activities listed under the prohibited activities lists, visitors must not intend to work in the UK and working includes um, working for an organisation or business in the UK or establishing or running a business as a self-employed person whilst doing a work placement or internship in the UK. And it also includes directly selling to the public 
Therefore, if an individual intends to come to the UK to work or undertake any of the activities on the right hand side, they'll be required to obtain the appropriate visa beforehand, which could include obtaining a skilled worker or intra-company transfer visa. If individuals are intending on establishing a business in the UK on behalf of their existing employer overseas, there is also an additional visa route they could apply for, which is the sole representative of an overseas business visa. So regarding payment for visitors, visitors must not be paid by the UK employer for any of the activities they'll be undertaking whilst in the UK. There are a few exceptions, which include paying reasonable expenses to cover the cost of the travel, including fees for directors attending board meetings as well. So I think we can conclude there that individuals are still able to visit the UK. And now going on to right to work checks. So as always, employers are required to undertake right to work checks for all individuals that are planning to start working for the company. And in terms of EA nationals, it was adequate to attain a copy of their passports or their national ID cards as part of the right to work checks. The EU settlement scheme was introduced to allow EA nationals to obtain pre-settled or settled status under the EU settlement scheme. And this was applicable to any individual um, who entered the UK prior to the 31st of December 2021, uh, sorry, 2020. And the deadline to obtain either of these statuses is the 30th of June 2021. Therefore, there are still individuals who are yet to obtain either of these statuses. So in terms of right to work checks, as an employer, you'll not be required to obtain information to identify if an EA national was in the UK by the end of last year to identify if you should be asking for either pre-settled or settled status confirming their um, right to work in the UK. The current guidance confirms that employers can rely on EA Nationals passport or their national ID cards up until the 30th of June 2021. If an individual does confirm to you that applied under the EU settlement scheme, then you can verify their right to work using the online checking tool and the individual will provide you with a code um, to confirm their status online. A new right to work check guidance will become available from the 1st of July 2021, which will confirm how you should undertake the right to work checks from that date onwards. The current guidance also does confirm that you're not required to undertake retrospective right to work checks in relation to any EA nationals that join the company between now and the 30th of June 2021. Okay, can I have the next slide, please? So as a continuation to right to work checks, I also want to just touch upon the temporary right to work checks which were made available during this COVID-19 period. Um, so whilst employers and employees are working remotely, an updated concession was introduced to allow employers to undertake right to work checks remotely and carry out right to work checks via a video call. So employers are able to verify an individual's right to work by seeing the original passport and individual via a video call and relying on a copy of the document which has been provided to them marking the document as an adjusted check undertaken on a specific date due to COVID-19. So employers are able to carry out right to work checks using the online checking tool as before if they wish to do so. However, this was just a more convenient way of doing so since um, April of last year. However, in relation to any right to work checks carried out relying on this temporary right to work check concession, will require employees to undertake retrospective right to work checks when this concession ends. This date is yet to be confirmed, however it is your responsibility to stay up to date with any changes and to ensure that you do carry out these right to work checks within the relevant time frame provided. Failure to carry out these retrospective checks will result in employing illegal workers, for which the penalties include fines of up to £20,000 per person and circumstances um, imprisonment. And just to end my section today's seminar, I just wanted to remind you of the deadline for the EU settlement scheme. So EA nationals and their relevant family members must obtain either of these statuses by the 30th of June 2021. Uh, in addition, there's a new graduate route opening for students on the 1st of July 2021, which allows students to apply for a visa valid for two years, which gives them the right to work in the UK. This may be important and relevant to those of you who are currently looking to sponsor individuals under the skilled worker route. Um, this is an alternative visa that they may apply for. And at the end of the two year period, it does also allow them to switch into the skilled worker route if you wanted to retain them. Um, I'll now hand back to Kate 
Good morning, everyone. Um, this morning, I'm going to be discussing the considerations for employers who are navigating the COVID-19 vaccine minefield, uh, as demonstrated by some of these headlines, which will appear on the next slide. There we go. Uh, vaccines have been heralded by many as the light at the end of the tunnel, which they may well be in terms of the UK's roadmap out of restrictions. However, employers should not underestimate the employment law implications and risks that could arise when looking at vaccines in a workplace context. Uh, there's obviously been a lot in the press recently about whether employers can require their employees to get the vaccine, as well as lots of information and certainly a lot of misinformation too on social media, not just about the vaccine, but also about what employers can and can't do when it comes to the vaccine. So, I'll unpack some of those issues, uh, offer some practical advice for employers in this short talk. So if we go on to the next slide, thank you. So uh, let's start off with one of the fundamental questions that employers have been asking recently. Can employers require their employees to have the COVID-19 vaccine? So currently the government has not legislated for the vaccine to be mandatory and so it's completely up to employers to decide how they will deal with it within reason. So employers cannot force employees to have a vaccine as it requires employee consent and at the moment there is no legislation that can force an individual to be vaccinated. However, employers have been using other strategies to try and ensure uh, vaccination, such as the much publicised no jab, no job policy, which was uh, famously or uh, infamously introduced by Pimlico Plumbers uh, very recently and has since been adopted by a number of other employers, including Care UK. Uh, the way such a policy tends to work is to make it a condition of employment that an individual has had the vaccine. So that would mean that new recruits would have to agree to this contractual provision when signing up to their employment contract. And in fact, the Justice Secretary has uh, recently seemingly endorsed this approach as being lawful in respect of new hires. However, imposing this requirement for existing employees uh, to have the vaccine is much trickier as employees would have to agree to this as a contractual variation to their existing terms, which many may refuse to do for a number of reasons, uh, not least because the government are not making vaccinations mandatory and uh, existing employees may argue that it is a breach of their right to a private life amongst other reasons. Uh, so in the absence of making the requirement to be vaccinated a contractual obligation, employers could argue that it is a reasonable management instruction and a failure to comply will be an offence capable of dismissal. But I will say that there are, of course, question marks over whether a refusal to be vaccinated would be a serious enough ground for dismissal or if it would be more reasonable to respond with a lesser disciplinary sanction. I think we'd sway towards the latter, but it will, of course, all be context dependent. So in short, and as things stand, employers can make it mandatory for their employees to be vaccinated, but in so doing, they expose themselves to a range of potential litigation risks, which can come in all shapes and sizes, which I will get onto now on the next slide. So first, it's important to note that there are a number of circumstances where vaccination may not be suitable. So government guidance suggests that individuals with immune system disorders or uh, serious allergies may not respond well to the vaccine and that until uh, more information is available, pregnant women should not have the vaccine as it has not been tested on that group. Uh, certain groups of employees may not be able to take the vaccine due to these reasons and others may simply refuse on other grounds, for example, um, on the basis of their religion. So employers who have made the vaccines mandatory are therefore exposing themselves to discrimination claims from those who can't or won't take the vaccine, for example, on grounds of pregnancy, disability or religion. Uh, another important angle for discrimination claims is the question of whether an anti-vax stance is a philosophical belief capable of protection under the Equality Act and therefore someone holding such a belief would have a discrimination claim if they refused to take the vaccine and as a result suffered a disadvantage. A belief is generally regarded as a philosophical belief 
if it meets a number of conditions which have all been set out in case law and these are uh, it's a belief rather than simply an opinion it's genuinely held it's worth of respect in a democratic society it relates to a weighty and substantial aspect of human life and it attains a certain level of cogency seriousness and importance if it meets those criteria then it may well be a philosophical belief and be afforded protection but it will of course depend on a specific specific individual and how they demonstrate their belief in practice so in our view, while an anti-vax belief is capable of being a protected characteristic, similarly to veganism or a belief in climate change, we are much more likely to see successful discrimination claims from people on the basis of religion, disability or maternity or pregnancy discrimination. So aside from discrimination claims, if the request for an employee to have the vaccine is considered a reasonable management instruction, a failure to comply can result in disciplinary action, ultimately leading to unfair dismissal or a constructive unfair dismissal claim. Vaccination without consent could also amount to the criminal offences of assault and battery. And finally, there's also the risk that the, uh, an employee who's compelled to take the vaccine and then subsequently has an adverse reaction. Um, and of course, we've seen um, this a lot in the news this week about the AstraZeneca vaccine, whether rightly or wrongly. Um, and if that person then tries to bring a personal injury claim against the employer, uh, but given the statistics on those suffering adverse reactions at the moment, it seems like a fairly low risk. So on the next slide. So what should employers be doing to mitigate the employment law risks? Um, so the key question will be whether the employer really needs to make vaccination mandatory or whether they can just actively encourage employees to get the vaccine to get to the same result instead uh, and thus avoiding the associated risks. Um, there are circumstances where a mandatory vaccine policy will be justified. So, for example, where employees need to travel to regions where a vaccine is required or where an employee is uh, required to have extensive contact with third parties and uh, or where social distancing or other COVID secure measures are not possible. Um, and also worth keeping in mind is the principle which requires health staff in certain settings to be inoculated against diseases, which may in time extend to other public sector workers and then also maybe retail and hospitality workers. Um, so aside from these certain justifiable situations, employers should consider whether an active encouragement to be vaccinated rather than a mandatory instruction would be a reasonable way forward. Such an approach may result in the same number of employees being vaccinated while simultaneously avoiding discrimination claims by those who are or feel unable to have the vaccine due to a protected characteristic. Uh, so employers can actively encourage employees to get the vaccine by uh, offering employees paid time off to attend vaccination appointments, paying employees their full salary if they are off sick with vaccine side effects or not counting absences caused by vaccine side effects as part of sickness records. Next slide, please. Um, so it's of course important to also bring into the conversation employers' health and safety obligations, which are crucial to any discussions surrounding vaccines and which I think illustrates the tension between the rights of an employee and the obligations of the employer in this situation. Um, as a reminder, under the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974, employers have a duty to ensure the health and safety of their employees as far as reasonably practical and not expose their workforce to health and safety risks. A failure to comply with these duties is a criminal offence. So in light of these duties, a mandatory vaccine programme may at first blush appear a sensible step forward. Uh, however, employers should carry out risk assessments considering whether there are reasonable alternatives to a mandatory vaccine policy and also if additional measures can be put in place if an employee chooses not to be vaccinated. Um, for example, where workers opt out of receiving the vaccine, it may be reasonable to require them instead to submit to a workplace testing regime. And uh, this is something that Pimlico plumbers have agreed to do essentially meaning that existing workers with a good reason to say no to the job can keep their jobs providing that they are regularly tested. Um, however, workplace testing comes with its own employment law and data protection related risks uh, just like vaccines so um, employers must also be mindful of 
this if they wish to put in place a testing programme instead. Uh, it's important to note that the government has this month put forward new regulations which extend the provisions relating to health and safety detriments to workers, not just employees. So at the moment, an employee can bring an employment tribunal claim against their employer if they reasonably believed um, that being at work um, would place them in serious imminent danger. And that also applies um, um, if they believe that it, 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 that risk could apply to someone else, such as a member of their household. Um, this right is now being used more commonly by employees who are anxious about travelling to or being at work, for example, in, in view of the current pandemic. Um, so if these new regulations are approved, this right will extend to workers too, and not just employees. It's something to bear in mind. Um, it will be important for employers to consult with employees or trade unions, if relevant, in the development of any vaccine policy and think about how that is then rolled out to employees. As always, communication in these circumstances is key and uh, if a non-mandatory vaccination policy is adopted, the way in which it's communicated to staff will be pivotal uh, in affecting the voluntary take-up of the vaccine. So let's go on to returning to work. So whether employers choose to have a mandatory or voluntary vac vaccination policy, many businesses are likely to end up in a position where some staff are vaccinated and others are not. So the question then arises of how an employer should manage the return to the workplace where there is that split between unvaccinated and non-vaccinated employees. So there are a number of angles to this question which employers will need to be aware of. So first, employers will need to be uh, aware and consider uh, the mixing of vaccinated and non-vaccinated employees. So they'll need to be mindful of health and safety duties to protect the workforce, but should also be aware of the possible discriminatory implications regarding reopening workplaces and encouraging the return to work. So, for example, if employers were to encourage vaccinated employees to return to the work ahead of non-vaccinated employees, this may be uh, indirectly age discriminatory, given that it's likely that older employees will be vaccinated before younger ones, given the UK's current vaccine programme. So employers will need to think carefully about whether any such policies are indirectly discriminatory and can be objectively justified. Uh, there's also the potential grievance and disciplinary issues that can arise when employees discuss important and uh, sensitive topics such as vaccines. And we've seen um, employment claims arise out of discussions surrounding politics, Brexit or even the World Cup. And given the emotional turmoil many will have experienced during the pandemic, this topic may trigger particularly strong reactions which result in workplace disputes or grievances between employees. Uh, so we'd recommend ensuring that you have good workplace policies in place so that any grievances or issues can be dealt with promptly and effectively. So another point to consider is that it's not necessarily the case that vaccinated individuals will feel uh, more comfortable um, to return to the workplace than, than others. As the impact of the vaccine on transmission is still unclear, vaccinated individuals may still be worried about picking up the virus and passing it on to family members or others and still may not feel safe to attend work. Uh, so employers will need to consider how to deal with such situations as well as potentially any whistleblowing claims that may be brought if someone feels that they are being forced to attend work where there is a, a serious imminent danger or if they suffer a detriment as a result. And lastly, uh, how will employers know who is being vaccinated and who hasn't? It's an important question. So employers will need to think about the approach they take in asking employees about whether they have been vaccinated and how they record and retain those responses and not least because health information is considered special category personal data under relevant data protection legislation. So employers will need to consider um, their data protection obligations in this regard including any amendments that will need to be made to privacy notices as a result. It's, it's a very uh, important and complex area and we, we recommend speaking to our uh, data protection experts, just Katie, uh, to get this special ad specialist advice. And then lastly, just moving on to the issue of vaccine passports. So um, the current landscape may change further if the government decides to go ahead with the so-called vaccine passports. 
So at the time of, of this seminar, the government has said it will conduct a review of the deep and complex issue of vaccine passports. We've already seen other countries uh, rolling out similar um, concepts. So Israel has rolled out digital vaccine certificates and Denmark and Sweden have said that they are developing vaccine passports ready for the summer. And uh, recently, the Australian airline Qantas has said that their travellers will need to be will need to prove um, before they board their flights that they have been vaccinated. So this could obviously have huge ramifications for employees who are required to travel regularly as part of their role. Um, what would happen if they refused to take the vaccine and therefore couldn't carry out their job? So an employer should first explore whether the employee's role could be varied such that travel was no longer required. For example, can they carry out um, their client meetings with international clients or contacts via video conferencing software instead, such as Skype, Zoom? Um, and if not, um, this potentially could be grounds for dismissal, uh, for example, on a, some other substantial reason or a capability basis, if the employee would no longer be able to perform their role if they couldn't travel internationally. However, um, again, employers should still tread very carefully should this situation arise, bear in mind the risk of discrimination and other types of claims um, on, on the basis of the, of the reasons we discussed earlier. So I suppose relevant to this as well will be what business travel will look like after uh, in, in the post-COVID um, world, but um, we can only guess at this point. So it, it's a watch the space on vaccine passports at the moment and the implications they hold for employers. And um, as with most other things related to the pandemic, the topic of vaccines in the workplace is constantly evolving as the government and employers respond to this ever-changing situation. So we'll be following the developments and are here to discuss should you have any qu queries. So do feel free to email us or give us a call if you've got any questions. Now I'm gonna pass over to Laura, who's going to be looking ahead at the issues um, we we are expecting um, and doing a kind of roundup of employment law. Thank you, Kate, and good morning, everyone. Um, today, I'm going to be taking you on a whistle stop tour of some of the key cases and developments from the last year, as well as having a look at what's on the horizon for 2021 and um, over and above the tricky COVID issues that I'm sure you're all currently grappling with. Um, I'm conscious of time and I've got quite a lot to get through, so forgive me if I run over some of these cases relatively fast. Um, if you do have any questions, feel free to pop them in the Q&A at the bottom and we'll, we'll try and have time for those at the end. Um, and if not, I'm obviously more than happy to answer questions on email after the session. So let's kick off with some of the key cases from last year. Um, the first couple of cases I'm going to talk about are on vicarious liability. Um, so the Morrisons case and the Barclays Bank case. The Morrisons one has been rumbling on for a while now. You might actually remember we covered it at our last seminar a couple of years ago. Um, and this involved an employee who essentially went rogue with employees' data. Um, this employee was subject to various disciplinary um, proceedings and decided to post personal data of um, around 50, uh, 5,000 employees online from his personal laptop. Um, a claim was brought against Morrison's by these employees, both in the High Court and then it went to the Court of Appeal. And in both of these instances, um, it was found that M Morrison's was to be vicariously liable for the employee's actions, which seemed slightly unfair given that the, um, Morrison's had various processes in place for ensuring that data would be processed in line with data protection principles and obligations. Morrison's, as you'd expect, appealed to the Supreme Court. The main thrust of their appeal was that um, the employee's wrongful acts were not committed during the course of his employment. Um, he'd gone rogue and he obviously he'd posted these, these online and wasn't authorised to do so by, by his employer. Um, the Supreme Court ag agreed with Morrison's and, and thankfully employers can, can breathe a sigh of, the, of relief here. Um, that Morrison's was not responsible for the employee's actions because he was acting out with the ordinary course of his employment. I think in this one, the facts are relatively obvious that the employee wasn't authorised to do this. I think in some other cases, it might be there might be more of a fine line as to um, whether the acts that the employees committed are within or out with the scope of their employment. 
And therefore, I think one of the, the takeaways from this case is that employers should think about how they define what an employee is and is not authorised to do as part of their employment um, to make sure that any conduct that they do which is not connected to their employment, we're clear that, that they weren't authorised to do that as part of their employment. Um, more generally, I think that it's a helpful reminder that in order to reduce employers' um, exposure for vicarious liability more generally, um, it's helpful to have measures in place which prevent the conduct and you know, poor conduct from happening in the first place. Um, we tend to be a broken record about these things as employment lawyers, but the obvious is making sure that you've got policies in place and that you are making sure that employees are trained on the policies um, to ensure that they are conducting themselves in the appropriate manner at all times. Um, there's a couple of cases that have come out quite recently that we don't have time to cover today, but that basically flag that and, and you know, the relevant points came down to the necessity of employers training their employees on their staff policies. Um, and, it, and it's not enough to have policies that have gone stale um, and that just sit at the back of a staff handbook with nobody really knowing where they're kept. So that's just one to bear in mind if, if you think that refresh of policies or, or training is needed going forward. So the Barclays case was also vicarious liability and I'm just, I'll just run over this one very quickly. Um, ultimately, the Supreme Court held that this case fell at the first hurdle because the individual who committed the acts in question um, was not in fact an employee, but was held to be an independent contractor. Um, in order for vicarious liability to be found, there needs to be that employment nexus. So the individual needs to be an employee and therefore in the facts of this case, the individual wasn't an employee and therefore the employer was not liable for his actions. I think that kind of highlights once again the importance of employment status in an employment relationship and obviously Richard has covered that in respect of IR35 rules but also it is important I will come on to talk about um, for the purpose of the Uber case but it often an employee's rights and entitlements um, often fall down on whether they're an employee or whether they're genuinely self-employed. Um, and here we're seeing vicarious liability can't be held if they are genuinely self-employed. So just another re um, reason to keep an eye on, on employee and contractor arrangements. So going on to the next slide. The next case is around the duty of confidentiality. So this case is relevant um, when thinking about new employees that you've got coming into your business who came from another employer and potentially brought confidential information of that employer into their new employment. So the facts of this case involved a group of sales consultants. They were employed by travel agent trail finders and they left to join a um, rap rival travel business, travel counsellors. The consultants provided their new employer with the names, contact details and information about all of Trailfinder's clients, which was very helpful for Trailfinders. Um, and in fact, Trailfinder said to them quite openly, yep, bring all the details with you, which perhaps wasn't the most clever thing for them to be doing. Um, Trailfinders used the data and a claim was brought that, that they were in breach of their duty of confidentiality to, um, sorry, travel, counselor, travel counselors used the data and the claim was, was by trail finders that they'd breached confidentiality in doing so. The judge held that the test that should be applied when a third party is in receipt of this information is whether a reasonable person, which is a phrase that us um, employment lawyers love using, whether a reasonable person in the position of the recipient, so in this case in the position of travel counsellors, um, would make inquiries when such information um, comes to their attention or comes across their desks. In this case, travel counsellors refused to make these inquiries um, and the court therefore held that it owed uh, an obligation of confidence to trail finders. Now, obviously, this will often be very fact specific. And in this case, I think as trail finders invited employees um, to bring, bring customer contact lists with them, they ought to have known that the information that they subsequently received and were using um, was at least in part or contained in part um, some confidential information. 
other cases it might not be so obvious but i think i think the key kind of takeaway from the decision is that turning a blind eye to any information that that is brought into the business by an employer an employee won't be an effective defense um, and when new employees come into the business it's worth applying caution um, to the information that they're bringing you may also want to warn employees and, and perhaps include it in their employment contracts that the information that they bring um, ask them to warrant that the information that they bring um, is not confidential and you would then hope that you flush it, any of those issues out at an early stage and that would therefore make sure that that you're at least aware of any well that the information isn't being brought in in the first place but also that, that there's a confidentiality duty there moving on to the uber case which i'm sure you'll all have heard about so i'm not going to go over the facts of this one in too much detail um, the good the good news is that uber have confirmed this morning that first of all fears will not go up as a result of the judgment um, and second of all and more importantly from a legal perspective uber is going to comply with the supreme court's decision which is that all of its UK drivers are in fact workers rather than self-employed contractors, as Uber was arguing. Um, and Uber have confirmed that they, wa they will now offer all of the 70,000 drivers that they have engaged in the UK, national minimum wage, holiday pay and pension contributions in accordance with these individuals' workers' rights. Um, some interesting points for the judgment, at least if, if you're an employment lawyer and, and points for us to be thinking about in practice, again, for any of you that engage, that do engage independent contractors, um, the, the court really focused on the subordination and dependency that the drivers had on Uber. So ultimately Uber, Uber had control over these individuals and that is something that, that the court put quite heavy emphasis on in saying, actually you're a worker, you're not self-employed and um, you very much rely on Uber for um, bringing in your money, which, which moves them away from, from being genuinely self-employed. The second important takeaway um, was the analysis that the court gave to what is happening on the, on the ground versus the written agreement. Um, and again, this is often one that comes up, is that in, in determining whether or not a self-employed contractor is a worker or indeed an employee, what is really important is what is happening on the ground, um, and even if if the written agreement or the you know the contractor agreement says you are not an employee, we do not we, you know have no liability for you being an employee. This is how things are operating. We don't have control over you. If what's actually happening on the ground is something different, then that's very much what the court will look at. And in fact, that is that is the the, the starting point as opposed to the contract itself. So. I think what that really flags is, um, you know, we need to be keeping an eye on what's happening on the ground with independent contractors. If there's any arrangements that have been put in place perhaps a while ago where, the, you know, the relationship did indeed start off as being an independent contractor and, and the person having quite a lot of control that is perhaps merged into a, a um, worker relationship because they've been there for a while or because um, of just the way that the relationship has um, grown. Then I think it's that's obviously worth um, assessing if you've got got contractors in your workforce. Moving on then um, to Brexit. Obviously, we can't talk about recent developments without mentioning Brexit. Albeit, um, I think it's a fairly brief one on this. At the moment, um, Brexit is not changing employment law in the UK in any significant way. It's unlikely that we'll see any sort of large scale overhaul of employment law anytime soon, which is largely in part due to the trade and cooperation agreement, um, which I'm sure you've all heard of, includes this, this level, play, level playing field um, between the UK and the EU, and, and it applies to fundamental rights at work, as well as health and safety, fair working conditions and employment standards. Um, so at the moment, it, it's, it's business as usual for those sorts of, of rights in the UK. In terms of employment rights that are derived from European case law and legislation, these have all been um, carried overall into domestic law, and this is being referred to as retained EU law. This means that the Employment Tribunal and the Employment Appeal Tribunal will continue to be bound by this law. However, the Court of Appeal and the Supreme 
support can choose to depart from retained EU law if it seems right to do so, which all seems quite vague. I guess we'll just have to see what happens, but Parliament can also choose to depart from um, the legislation if it seems right to do so, and therefore I guess it will be interesting to see whether or not whether or not that happens in practice. In terms of future European Court of Justice decisions, the UK won't be bound by them, but the courts and tribunals may have regard to anything done or um, on or after the end of the transition period. Um, so ultimately, these decisions will be persuasive rather than rather than binding um, on the UK courts. In terms of what's coming forward. Um, sorry, what to look out for going forward. So there's a couple of holiday pace cases that we've just got on our radars, um, which means that the calculation of holiday pay may rear its head again, everyone's favorite topic. Um, so there's a case called Flowers and East of England Ambulance Trust. In this case, the court is looking at whether or not, and this is, will be a Supreme Court judgment, and um, whether or not voluntary overtime, which is sufficiently regular and settled, should be in the calculation of holiday pay. Some of you may remember and, and know that holiday pay should be calculated, should include anything that's regarded as normal pay. And there, there's, there's been debate over whether voluntary overtime is, is normal pay or not. And the Supreme Court should hopefully help give some clarification on that point. And the second holiday pay case that we're looking out for is an appeal to the Supreme Court of a Northern Ireland Court of Appeal case, um, which disagreed with some UK case law, which held that if there was a gap of three months or more um, in the underpayment of holiday pay, or if holiday pay had been paid correctly at some point over a three month period, then ultimately what that does is it breaks the series of deductions for the purposes of the claim. Um, so therefore, this is an important case to watch because if the Supreme Court holds that the three month gap doesn't break the series of underpayments, which is um, what has been claimed, then workers will be able to recover underpayments going back two years rather than, rather than breaking the chain every three months. Um, and this would evidently significantly increase the cost of any historical holiday pay claims um, because employers wouldn't be able to, to rectify that by making a payment or, or having a three month gap in between unlawful payments. One further point um, just to mention is that the government have launched a consultation on post termination restrictions um, and our very own employment partner Kate Brearley led a committee of city solicitors which submitted a response to the consultation. Um, the consultation covered a number of things, but one of the things that it, it brought into focus and, and asked about was whether or not employers should be required to pay ex-employees a percentage of their salary for the period of time that they're out the market um, or for the, the duration of the non-compete period um, or whether in fact non-compete should be banned altogether. So again, this is just one to watch. I'm, I'm reliably informed that, that the early kind of results of the consultation look as though the UK will likely adopt an approach that's, that, that says in order for post-termination restrictions to be enforceable, employees, ex-employees should be, at least be paid some kind of percentage of their salary for that period. Um, now what constitutes pay, whether bonuses would be included and, and what that percentage looks like is, is a different question. Um, but as I said, just one to keep in your radars as obviously um, post-termination restrictions and contracts would need to potentially vary depending on, on the um, outcome of the consultation um, and, and we'd be looking to, to, you'd be looking to revise post-termination restrictions going forward. I think that's all we've got time for for now so I'm going to hand you back over to Paul. If you do have any questions pop them in the Q&A box um, and we'll hopefully get through a few before um, Thank you, Laura. Thanks to all our speakers this morning. Um, and thank you also um, for you, um, the audience, for sending through your questions. If you could indulge us for a, a few more minutes, we'll try and get through those questions um, uh, as quickly as you can. Well, one of the, the, the questions that's coming up quite frequently is about lateral flow tests. 
So, um, Kate and Katie, I think this is probably one for you two about um, what are the employment data protection issues and, um, that are around lateral flow testing. And then a second question that's been asked is, um, are employers um, permitted to ask employees if they've had the vaccination? So, um, Kate, do you want to go first? Yeah, hopefully you can all still hear me. Clearly there are no benefits to uh, working from the office and everyone should just continue to work from home forever. Um, but anyway, yeah, it's a, it's a good question considering um, the, the increase in the use of lateral flow tests at the moment and the government are giving employers uh, free tests um, to go out and test their staff. So I think the first thing that employers will need to consider when um, thinking about adopting lateral flow test program is uh, whether collecting employee health information or asking staff to be tested is actually necessary in the circumstances. Um, so when evaluating this, you'll have to think about things like the type of work, the type of premises, uh, can employees work from home, um, for example, can they uh, continue to adhere to effective social distancing measures in the workplace? And if so, is there really a need for, for tests to be put in place? Um, testing for legitimate interests is likely to be appropriate, um, but each individual employer will need to make their own risk assessment for their own organisation. And of course, there's, there's a lot of things to consider when thinking about implementing a, a lateral flow test um, or, or PCR test uh, policy. Um, so who is the test going to cover? Will it be employees or is it going to be everyone working on the site? Um, will it cover individuals without symptoms as well as those with? Uh, how often will staff be tested and is it um, is it actually regular enough to be to be um, accurate? Um, I know that lateral flow tests are in, in and of themselves are, are less accurate than PCR tests so taking that into consideration as well um, do you have appropriate uh, facilities to to test people in a separate room can they wait there until they, they get the results? Um, are you purchasing your own tests or, or sorting your own tests or are you are you going to be outsourcing to a third party and if so have you done diligence on them and their capabilities um, how will the test results be dealt with how the, will they be recorded is that all going to be in a centralized register of positive test or negative test or whatever it might be um, I think that leads me on to kind of passing on to Katie because the data protection elements of of testing and recording that data are are I think uh, key here. So I won't uh, I won't cover those now. I'll pass I'll pass that that question on to Katie if I may. Thanks, Kate. I think you've already done most of the hard work for me there because a lot of the data protection implications are the same as you've just been describing. So data protection, or I mean obviously testing is going to involve you collecting not only personal data of your employees but sensitive or special category personal data health data um, but data protection or isn't going to prevent you doing that it, as long as you've done that thinking as to whether and and how it's necessary which employees you're testing and whether you're doing that in a responsible way so it, if you've done that anyway um, and, and you can show you've done that thinking by, for example, um, completing a data protection impact assessment is always a good, a good thing to do for accountability purposes under GDPR, but you have to do one where there is a high risk to individuals. So particularly where you're looking at any kind of mandatory element, there's definitely a risk there um, to individuals. And in any case, it's a good idea to do an impact assessment just so that you could document and work through what are the risks here and how we're going to mitigate them. Um, there's likely to be a legal basis for testing employees if, if you know, if it's necessary to protect staff or, or the public. Um, as Kate said, the, you know, it, the tests need to be effective. You need to actually show that the data you're collecting um, is meaningful, is actually helpful in the cause of employee safety or public health. Um, you need to be really um, transparent and to update your privacy notices to tell staff exactly how you're handling their, their personal data collected through these uh, these lateral flow tests um, and uh, you know also think about how that data is shared or accessed by other members of staff ideally be getting external uh, medical professionals in and certainly not sort of colleagues uh, supervising each other so there's an element of privacy you need to consider in that 
um, in particular, if there's going to be any, um, if there's going to be a mandatory testing system, any negative uh, potential negative consequences for individuals would weigh on whether it, there is a lawful basis under data protection or to do the tests. So that's an important consideration. Um, it's not, but it, you know, it can be justifiable. It's not completely ruled out by data protection law. Thank you both. And Kate, um, asking people about vaccinations. Again, I think it, it's, it's the same principle as uh, we've been talking about for the lateral flow uh, and PCR uh, tests. It's what, what are you going to do with that information once you've got it? If you've got a list of employees who have had it and a list of those who haven't, are you then going to be treating those people who, who have had the vaccine differently to those who haven't? And then could that potentially lead to discriminatory consequences as a result? As I've mentioned, um, if you're using that to inform your return to work policies, you're getting those who have been vaccinated in before those who haven't. Is that indirectly age discriminatory? Can it be objectively justified? Um, if you're if you're using uh, that information to give advantages um, to those who have been vaccinated and, and, and as a result, those who haven't are disadvantaged, are you going to get employee relations slash discrimination issues arising from that? So I think employers will just have to be very clear about the basis on which they're collecting that information and what it's going to be used for and making sure that's documented and communicated to people and, and transparent. Yeah. I think that's right. It's, it's, it's basically, do we actually need the information? I know it'd be nice to have, but do we do we really need it? Um, Kimia, one for you now. I think um, if an employer applies for an intra-company visa, uh, can that visitor perform work for the employer? So yeah, the short answer is yes to that question. But if you're applying for an intra-company transfer visa, it is in theory a work visa. So you're informing the Home Office they are coming over to the UK to undertake this specific role and you're basically approving that that role is an acceptable role um, to undertake in the UK and also confirming as well what salary they'll be being paid. So an intercompany transfer is good for short-term comments to the UK. If you're looking at longer term, then a skilled work would be the most appropriate visa. Great. Thank you, Kimia. Um, Richard, uh, one for you, I think, now. Um... Is there anything that we can include in our contracts with intermediaries to protect end users in relation to IR35? Thanks, Paul. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thanks, yeah. Um, how long have we got? Um, firstly, apologies. I realised my, my video wasn't on when I was doing my talk, so which, which appreciate may not have been a bad thing, but um, I, am, I can assure you I'm here. Um, so the short answer, Paul, to that question is yes, absolutely. Um, but I think really there are, there are two levels to the answer to that question. Um, firstly, looking at, at if anything can be included to reduce the chance of a positive status determination. Uh, and yes, of course, there are things that can be included around you know, who has the levels of control, when or where the services have to be provided. Um, wording that suggests uh, a genuine self-employed, or the individual is genuinely self-employed rather than an employment relationship um, can be included in contracts. But I think it's becoming more and more apparent that actually a practical reality is what's important here. And, and that was certainly uh, borne out by the, by the Uber ju judgment. Um, so, you know, the, uh, for example, the substitution clause is not going to do much good unless there is uh, going to be some reliance or the ability to rely on that substitution clause. Um, but even, even taking that into account, and, and the second element to the answer, um, there are other practical aspects that can be included in the contract to, to help you from a, from a practical perspective. So, for example, having a contractual obligation for um, the intermediary uh, to be obliged to provide you with information that you might need to carry out a, you know, an updated status determination in the future um, will be very helpful um, because that's going to help you carry out the status determination, which is the obligation on you. Um, but having that contractual obligation on them to help you with that uh, is going to be very helpful. Um, the ability to deduct uh, to, to deduct income tax and NICs from fees um, it should be included because otherwise you could end up in a position where you have a contractual obligation to pay fees gross, 
but a legisl legislative obligation to uh, operate PAYE. Uh, and therefore, you could be in a, in a position of conflict between your contractual obligations and your legislative obligations. Um, so that is something you, you, you might want to be looking to, um, to include. Uh, and also, depending on how draconian you want to be, the possibility of, of including some sort of termination provision um, around status determination. So th there are other things, but that's just a, just a flavour of, of what you might want to, to include. Um, but it's definitely the case that you want to be looking at your contracts with, uh, in relation to contractors with the implementation of R35. Yeah, I think it's, it's consistent with the direction of travel that we've seen over a, a number of years now that um, the government's legislative approach is trying to push people into this. If you're a genuine contractor, fine, you are, but otherwise trying to push you down the other route for um, putting you into the employee camp. Um, Katie, Another one for you, and I don't think there is an answer to this. Um, is there any way we can make DSARS less painful? <laughs> Short answer, no. I don't know what you mean, they're a delight. <laughs> um, if you, I would, there is an element I would say this, wouldn't I? But if you have done all of your good GDPR compliance uh, steps that I can assist you with, uh, so your data mapping, knowing where your data is, and actually having things like appropriate retention policies in place so you, you know where to look and you haven't got too much data in the first place, that can really help. Um, also, if you have access to a kind of document review platform where you can, uh, you, you might use a litigation, for example, where you can tag things and, and redact yeah. them and exclude them, that's really helpful. And if you don't, if you're not a large organization that has one of those in house, let me know because we, have, we can give you access to one of ours. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that brings us up to 11. Um, last couple of questions we had were, are we sharing the videos and the slides? Yes, we will uh, after this event. And then the last question, where do I get one of those t-shirts to do the gardening or the decorating? Um, that was from me. <laughs> yeah, um, with every DSAR request we advise on, um, we'll throw in a t-shirt for free. <laughs> Courtesy of Katie. Well, Thank you everyone um, for attending this morning and um, giving up your, your valuable time. We, we look forward to seeing you soon in the office um, or face to face in, a, in another setting. So um, thank you and uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks.